Hello friends, uh, as we talked about uh, deindustrialization in one of the earlier lectures in the series on history of India from 1750s to 1857. So, we will continue uh, from the point uh, we were talking about and how the nationalists uh, their idea with regard to deindustrialization uh, which was criticized by some of the scholars like uh, uh, those who were the European scholars Daniel and Alice Thorner, those who do not uh, regard that uh, deindustrialization took place in India and how uh, they see it as some sort of a worldwide phenomena. In that series, we also find Morris de Morris and Morris de Morris has also seen it from that perspective that during this period more than 2 million handlooms in operations were in they were there in 18 in 1951 and they could not have come into existence overnight. He also raises doubts as whether deindustrialization actually occurred in the traditional industry and the rising demand of the cotton cloth in the 19th century due to the increasing population and due to changing customs in dresses. So, we find that scholars western scholars like Daniel and Alice Thorner and Morris de Morris. Uh, they tend to understand deindustrialization in this particular framework where they uh, do, do not want to regard that deindustrialization uh, actually took place in India. And uh, they, uh, ri they raise doubts uh, with regard to any kind of deindustrialization in the textile sector in India. And uh, uh, they suggest that uh, if uh, any kind of handloom operations which were taking place in India uh, and they give this kind of a data. Uh, of 1951 that if such numbers were there uh, the 2 million figure which they have given then they could not have come overnight. So, definitely uh, the, this kind of an operation these operations must have been continuing. So, uh, if you tend to understand that uh, 2 million is not a very big figure and in the context of the Indian population that how 70 percent of the population was engaged in agriculture, they did not have much avenues. So, even the kind of data which they have given to substantiate uh, this argument uh, defeats uh, the kind of argument which they have given. So, one has to understand deindustrialization in the framework of data which, which is available with us and or at the same time the kind of qualitative studies which have taken place that how so many people they suffered and they suffered for nothing. And Morris de Maris, he has also uh, talked about uh, the demand that how this demand was so significant that the British exports to India were being less. And uh, so, there was enough room left for the Indian handicrafts development this is what he argues then that despite fall in the cloth prices fact that Manchester exported machine made yarn at a cheap rate. Uh, competitive position of Indian weavers was strengthened. So, these kinds of arguments they have also been uh, given that there was a lot of room which was left for the Indian handicraft development though uh, we find that the kind of the, these kinds of arguments they are not based on any kind of empirical data or evidence and these are just some kind of interpretations which are not uh, taking into account the uh, the issue of deindustrialization in India and the way uh, the Indian spinners weavers all of them they suffered and uh, they have also uh, he has also argued from uh, the framework that because of the coming of the cheap yarn in india now the indian weavers position was strengthened but he does not take into account that how uh, the kind of labor which was being put up by uh, the indian uh, handicraftsmen indian weavers uh, that, that has to be taken into account and even when they were getting uh, this kind of a cheap yarn even then uh, uh, they, they did not become competitive uh, with the machine made products which came to India. And the scholars like Toru Matsui, Bipin Chandra, Tapan Rai Chaudhary uh, they uh, criticize Morris on this count and they say that uh, the, his ideas were a mere speculation and uh, uh, Morris ignored a large body of evidence about the decline in the traditional handicrafts and the economic position of the weavers uh, 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 which was these data and these uh, records were uh, easily available. And uh, it is available in a wide variety of sources which are ranging from the government sources and the famine reports uh, to the eyewitness accounts. So, we find that the ideas of Morris de Morris they have been criticized by Indian scholars. 
like Tapan Chaudhary, Bipin Chandra, Toru Matsai as well and uh, they see that uh, the kind of uh, records which uh, Morris should have seen, he has not referred to them and uh, his ideas could only be seen in some uh, sense of speculation. And uh, we also find that the domestic, uh, the market uh, which could have grown a little because of an increase in population, but we do not have uh, this kind of a record, very little evidence is available uh, to suggest that there was an increase in the per capita income of the country uh, during the 19th century. So, uh, the kind of data which he has referred where uh, this has been argued that the per capita income of the country uh, it increased during the 19th century, it is not based on sound foundations and uh, the domestic market also did not grow to that extent and we do not have any kind of an evidence where per capita income uh, of the country increased as well. So, Toru Matsui, Bipin Chandra, Tapan Rai Chaudhary they argue in this uh, framework and they criticize uh, Morris on this count and they try to point out uh, the kind of deindustrialization which definitely took place in India and they say in this context that how the per capita income during this period uh, it uh, declined. And uh, we also uh, have to see uh, in a particular framework that how uh, the cost reducing technologies which were there in Britain at that point of time and has been argued by uh, uh, the scholars uh, as you can see on the screen as well that how uh, the, 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 these arguments that uh, weavers they, they were going to benefit in some way uh, they were not realistic in nature. And, uh, if there was some kind of a fall in the prices of the woven goods due to the cost reducing technological innovations, it was happening in Britain, in England, but not in India. So, uh, one has to realize uh, the situation of India and when this argument is being given that uh, cheaper yarn import in India was beneficial to the weavers. So, that was not the uh, situation at the uh, ground level, it was not the situation in reality, it was just an argument uh, to in a way communicate their viewpoint that deindustrialization de definitely uh, was not due to uh, the colonial intervention. And uh, if we tend to understand the kind of ideas which have been given by Morris in the context of the weaving community and uh, uh, where he is saying that the Indian population was comparatively uh, impoverished all the time uh, or relatively impoverished when you compare it to the western Europeans. Uh, uh, then and observers they tend to recognize it as a result of deindustrialization rather than an age old phenomena. So, Morris uh, suggestion or argument that uh, that the weaving community in India or Indian population they were relatively impoverished when they were being compared to the western Europeans and uh, you cannot just blame it on deindustrialization is uh, only is, is not uh, tenable that way because when you see the kind of uh, uh, the kind of uh, affluence in India when you see the Indian the way Indian population was living then you will not find that uh, at any point of time India could be considered as a poor country and how India was contributing to the world trade at that point of time because be before the arrival of the British and how British they took a lot of money from India in the context of the drain of wealth. So, these kind of generalized arguments without any basis uh, they have been in a way negated by some of the scholars like Meghna Desai and Meghna Desai has talked about that how uh, they have to increase uh, their earnings uh, when when the Indians th they will only be become competitive when they will uh, increase the uh, either uh, they have to in uh, increase their productivity by 43 percent or uh, they have to reduce uh, 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 his earnings by more than 30 percent. So, then only we will find that uh, Indian weaver uh, would be uh, more competitive in nature and he is talking about this period from 1881 to 21, 1818 to 1821 and from 1829 to uh, 1831. So, that is uh, the period which has been talked about uh, Meghnath Desai and when you when we tend to understand that when you talk about uh, the kind of changes which were ha happening in the Indian economy then we have a lot of evidence with regard to the decline of uh, the traditional uh, sectors here and uh, uh, one does not notice any new center uh, coming up in the context of India 
and the number of artisans in the villages or existing cities that also did not go up and Morris contention that there was no absolute decline in number of persons engaged in handicraft sector is questionable. So, when we tend to understand the kind of evidence which uh, we have then we would find that there is a lot of evidence with regard to the decline of the traditional uh, textile uh, centers in India. And we also find that none of uh, the new centers they were coming up uh, in, in, in the context of India and the number of artisans uh, it, it also did not go up in any of the cities or any of the centers in India or the rural even the rural centers. And uh, the, all the contentions which have been made uh, by Morris in this regard uh, they have also been questioned by the historians. Tirthankar Roy is another historian who uh, tries to see the traditional industry in that sense that it did not decline only the organization and the character changed and uh, they were uh, the weavers were merely the victims of technological outmodedness or obsolescence. So, Shashi Tharoor has criticized this idea uh, that if it is possible plausible that handlooms would have found it difficult to compete with the mass produced machine made textiles, but they would have surely have been able to hold on to a niche market as they do to this day in India. So, the idea of technological outmodedness given by uh, Tirthankar Roy has been in a way uh, uh, criticized by Shashi Tharoor and where he has argued that if Indians they would have got any kind of a chance uh, to compete uh, with the machine produced uh, uh, machine made textiles then Indians they would have definitely uh, done it uh, as they did at later times when India became independent and any kind of a competition from machinery then Indians definitely would have made their own machinery or either imported machinery uh, from other regions and uh, they would have uh, been more competitive in that context and it would have been a very natural uh, kind of a process where Indians uh, would have done it at their own pace. And uh, uh, when, uh, when we find that this kind of an import would have been done then Indian uh, would have that kind of an advantage over the Europeans as well. And uh, uh, we find that uh, uh, the lower wages of the Indian workers at that point of time uh, uh, would have given or provided them some kind of a an advantage over the European competitors on a level playing field. So, uh, this kind of an advantage which Indians had with regard to the lower wages uh, which Indians uh, they were being paid at that point of time then definitely uh, they would have been able to compete with the Europeans if they were provided a level playing field. But that was not the case uh, in the context that how Indians they, they did not have any kind of a level playing field when they were uh, trying to compete with the Europeans. And scholars like Amir Bhagchi uh, they have given some kind of figures as you can see on the screen as well. Uh, uh, they have given figures of Buchanan Hamilton, uh, Buchanan Hamilton uh, survey of 1809 and 13 and uh, the census figures of 1901 and they say that the percentage of population which was dependent on industries in Bihar declined from 18.5 to 8.5 along with the most massive fall in number of cotton spinners and weavers. So, we find that scholars uh, like Amir Bhakchi they have uh, uh, they have used uh, some kind of a figures uh, which were available uh, with them and on even on the basis of those figures uh, they have uh, tried to show that how uh, the cotton spinners and the weavers they suffered uh, at the hands of the British and the British uh, policies were in no way uh, beneficial to these people. And uh, Amir Bhakchi also uh, uh, provides another data that by 1890 1 million were out of job and the sugar industry of Shahabad declined due to the inflow of cheap sugar from Java and Sumatra, then decline of paper industry of Gaya and Shahabad, then survival of handloom industries more an index of poverty of agriculture than of any innate strength of handloom industry. So, we find that the kind of figures which have been given by uh, historians and economists like Bhakchi they communicate that definitely so many people they were out of job uh, because of the colonial policies 
and how uh, we also find that uh, various industries in different places uh, they were seeing uh, a lot of decline and when you see that how handloom industry survived then uh, we have to see it in, in the context of the poverty of agriculture the po that uh, agricultural activities were not able to provide any kind of support uh, to the people those who were engaged in agriculture and it should not be seen in the context of any kind of a strength uh, of the handloom industry rather it was uh, the kind of poverty of agriculture which forced them uh, to hold on to the handloom industry. Uh, uh, Bachi has also been criticized on certain grounds because uh, he has concentrated only in uh, one region that is Gangetic Bihar and uh, Maria Vigziani uh, uh, has doubted the reliability of figures which have been provided by Hamilton who was a traveller. So, uh, Bachi's contention is based on the figures of uh, uh, Hamilton and Buchanan and uh, so the figures they which have been given they have also been criticized and uh, 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 Bak uh, Vigziani also criticizes Bakchi on the count that that when Bakchi says that spinners were able to sustain their families without uh, uh, relying on other uh, occupations. So, that has also been uh, criticized by uh, Vigziani. Uh, Krishnamurti has also uh, criticized Bakchi uh, in the context that Bakchi does not provide any mechanism to ascertain uh, actual income of the workers. For example, the Jhumris of Bhagalpur and Jolas of Purnia, they were the part time singers and many spinners in the Gangetic Bihar, they worked in off season in threshing wheat. So, uh, why these people they needed to supplement their income, the poverty, insufficient resources and the decline in income. So, these can be the factors uh, because of which we find that uh, these people they had to sort to part time income as well. So, we have to see in this context that people they, they resorted uh, uh, to the other kinds of alternative employment because they were poor, they did not have uh, adequate means to support themselves and uh, because of which they went to uh, the other sectors as well. So, Gyan Pandey has uh, tried to see the decline in the framework uh, of uh, the uh, uh, from the superior crops to uh, superior uh, products to the inferior products. You can see the image of Bipin Chandra. Uh, and both Bipin Chandra and Gyan Pandey, uh, they have talked about the weaving, weaving sector in eastern UP and they communicate that it offered some resistance by producing the coarse cloth or by producing exotic, exo exotic varieties like weavers of Mao produce Dakhini Pagli. So, uh, this kind of a change uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, from uh, from quantitative data they try to see the picture in the qualitative context that how uh, new varieties uh, uh, were they, they were being produced at that point of time and uh, how the uh, how the uh, how the zamindars and how uh, the money lenders all of them uh, they were ganging up uh, against the people uh, in at that point of time and uh, the British agencies which were related to credit and the money lenders both of them, uh, they, they were also responsible many times uh, for such kind of a situation. And uh, uh, most of the Jolaha, Jolahas in eastern UP, they were Muslims and money lenders were the Hindus. So, this also tries to explain the kind of communal fight during that point of time in the uh, context uh, in the framework of Gyan Pandey who tries to explain it in this context and the British they termed the Jolaha, Jolahas uh, as bigoted. So, we have to understand uh, uh, the situation in, in the kind of historiography which has been given by some of the scholars and uh, we have to see it in a, um, in a larger framework that how the kind of tribal revolts which were taking place in different parts, they were also an attack on their culture, the, the kinds of uh, the kind of attacks on the Santhals and, uh, and on other people. Uh, we find that uh, these people, they were, uh, they, they felt that their cultural practices, they will be affected and British, uh, they were ready to attack uh, their cultural practices in all possible manner. So, this kind of a response uh, to the British by the tribals or by the peasants could also be seen in the framework uh, of their cultural practices. And uh, we find that 
how uh, 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 many times the kind of coarse cloth which was being uh, produced uh, in India, uh, because uh, this coarse cloth was being used by, uh, it, uh, uh, by the people those who were poor and uh, it was also being preferred uh, for the uh, durability. And he has also seen uh, in this particular framework that uh, how railways were not an important factor during that point of time, uh, because uh, railways could not penetrate many areas uh, in India and how uh, uh, Lancashire manufacturers uh, they could not find every market in India. So, uh, if we see see this in the framework that uh, railways they start operating from 1853 uh, onwards and uh, uh, railways uh, they find uh, they were able to secure many markets for the British in terms of sending the finished products. But at the same time the growth of railways also uh, takes uh, a lot of time in that context, uh, but British uh, they were definitely sending their products to or uh, to uh, many many markets in India and because of which we find that uh, deindustrialization is there in different sectors. And uh, we find that how uh, the industrial uh, revolution in Britain uh, was based on the uh, thriving industries which were there in India. And if you see that how uh, the uh, textiles which were there in India they were uh, uh, they were very very popular how these textiles uh, which were there in India they, they were able to sustain themselves and they were also being exported in large numbers and how uh, these textiles they were being substituted by the products which were being manufactured in Britain. So, British they were using the Indian raw material and they were exporting the finished products back to India and to the rest of the world. So, we find that this kind of a situation uh, could also be seen in the kind of the capitalist climate which was there that initially the mercantile capitalism then we have the industrial capitalism and then we have the finance capitalism. So, uh, the British those who came as merchants they tried to, they used all sorts of uh, mercantile capitalist tactics in India and thereafter uh, uh, they, uh, they changed to the industrial capitalism where from uh, where from India how they were taking the products from uh, the raw materials from India and uh, sending them to Britain and how the finished products they were finding the markets in India that was also happening in the second phase of uh, uh, the capitalism which is the industrial capitalism. And in the third phase uh, which is the finance capitalism we find that how the British capital found uh, markets in India how railways and telegraphs and uh, other sorts of railways, bridges roads etcetera they were being financed by the British capital and how that was being used uh, for their own purposes. So, scholars they have uh, tried to see that how uh, Indians uh, they were at a very receiving end and uh, how Bengal at that point of time uh, was sending so many exports how exports the number of exports was quite high and uh, Shashi Tharoor has given this kind of a figure as you can see on the screen as well the figure is there that uh, the textile exports were around 16 million rupees in 1750s uh, and uh, apart from that besides that 5 to 6 million rupees worth uh, was exported by European traders in India. And uh, if you see the rates of exchange of those times then it was 2 billion pounds uh, it was a considerable sum in those times. Uh, when you see that earning a pound a week was to be a rich man. So, if you see 2 million that is the 20 lakh pounds that was the amount which was there and it was uh, there for a quite considerable period of time we are only talking about year after year. And this kind of a drain which was taking place from India because uh, initially British they were getting some kind of a bullion to purchase products, but we find that uh, now they were not even getting bullion they were making investments from the revenue which they were getting from Bengal, Bihar and Odisha. So, they, uh, they realized that when they will make such kind of investments uh, from the revenues uh, of uh, the regions uh, which were under their control in India then they did not have to bring that kind of an amount from India. And uh, we also find that Shashi Tharoor argues that India enjoyed 25 percent share of the global trade in textiles in the early 18th century and this was destroyed 
and Lord William Bentinck, who was the Governor General, he wrote that the bones of the cotton weavers were bleaching the plains of India. So, if you try to compare this kind of a data uh, in the context of the global trade, where Indians they enjoyed a 25 percent share, and how when you compare it with uh, uh, that less than 2 percent, so that was the kind of economy which India had, and British they. Uh, uh, were writing from the Eurocentric point of view, how they were trying to negate that uh, all sorts of uh, crimes, all sorts of uh, 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 drain of wealth which was committed by them against India in the context, uh, 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 the way history has been written. So, it has to be negated or it has been negated uh, by the nationalist historians, those who have uh, tried to question the British or uh, the European viewpoint where they tend to disregard deindustrialization uh, definitely happened in India. And uh, when we tend to understand the kind of impact which it had that how uh, not only the decline of the industry, but how the ruralization of the economy also took place and uh, the artisans they did not have uh, many, many alternative areas where they should go. And this uh, kind of a thing in the context of agriculture, uh, when we see that more and more people they joined agriculture uh, and because of which you will find that how the holdings they got divided and the problems of the inferior and unproductive lands, they were also the results of uh, the British uh, impact. And we also find the issues which were regard to the unemployment in India or disguised unemployment, they were also there uh, in the context of uh, the policies which were followed by the British. And these kind of imbalances in the context of uh, uh, this period could also be seen. And when we tend to understand deindustrialization, uh, we see that uh, uh, it has also been argued that we have to locate it in the regional variations as some historians have argued and the overall um, employment output and incomes of the artisans in India uh, definitely suffered a notable decline. So, uh, uh, deindustrialization definitely created such kind of an impact uh, uh, where Indians they had to suffer. And uh, historians they have also tried to see it in the framework of shifting from uh, quantitative to the qualitative data. And uh, uh, the, we have to see it in the framework that how Indian industry uh, it uh, suffered during uh, this time and uh, deindustrialization uh, in a way uh, created such kind of a conditions where we find that modern industries could not develop. No, thank you very much.